Well, tonight uh, we're going to continue in uh, Tulip. Uh, we have about, including tonight, we have two more uh, times in Tulip. Now, the way the month of July is going to work out, uh, we won't have evening service next week, and then we uh, will have it. We, yeah, we won't have it next week, the tenth, and then we'll have it the seventeenth and the twenty fourth. But we won't have it the thirty first because we'll have the uh, psalm sing. So basically, what we're going to do this month is we'll close out uh, you know, perseverance of the saints on the seventeenth and do kind of a, you know bring it all together. Uh, teaching time on the 24th, and then we'll start something new in August. Uh, so if you have anything percolating on your brain that you'd like to uh, discuss or, or learn or anything like that, just let me know, and we'll we'll get on that in August. But like I said tonight, uh, we're going to go up into part three of the Perseverance of the Saints, and we're going to talk about the doctrine of hell. And we're going to talk about reprobation. And we're going to talk about wickedness in general. So let's go ahead and go tonight uh, to Matthew 23 for our kind of starting verse uh, today in Matthew 23. Now, as you're turning there, again, context is always important in the Bible. You know, what's going on here? Uh, Jesus is, uh, in, in many ways, preaching his sermon against the Pharisees. You know, we can think Matthew 5 is the Beatitudes, right, the blessings. Well, this chapter is the cursings. You know, we've gone over that a little bit in, in the morning in Deuteronomy, how we've seen the blessings and cursings of Moses. Well, Matthew 5 is kind of the blessings of Jesus, and now we're in the cursings of Jesus. And chapter 23, right, is this long uh, testimony of judgment against the Pharisees who have led the people astray. And to start us off tonight, we're going to begin by reading verse 31. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves, that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I said, uh, or excuse me, I you know, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. And some of them you will scourge in, the, in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. That on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth. And the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah and of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. So Jesus, right, is speaking against Pharisees. He is speaking about their uh, you know, evil and the things that they have done. And one of the things that he marks out for them is that they are serpents, that they are a brood of vipers. Now, you know, Jesus here is not playing you know, kind of word association games. He's deadly serious about who he says they are related to. And... Going back to the very beginning of the Bible, you know, who is the first serpent that we meet? Satan, right? And so Jesus here is saying as explicitly as he can that they are sons of the devil, that they are sons of Belial. You know, he will do the exact same thing in his conversation with them in John chapter 8. Remember there how they're claiming to be sons of Moses and Jesus says, no, you're not. Right? Who are you sons of? Your father, the devil. And what makes them of their father, the devil, is the way in which they witness against themselves that because they also murder the prophets. Now, you, which prophets have they murdered so far? Old Testament prophets. Well, I mean, they, yeah, the Old Testament prophets, but th these particular Pharisees. You know, they weren't really involved in the in the murder of John the Baptist, right? That was all Herod's doing, right? Trying to impress the underage daughter of his brother's wife, whom he married. You know, the the story of Herod is so filled with with, with evil and wickedness that it's almost beyond you know comprehension. But what we see with Herod is not something new. Right? That was a common thing back in those days. 
you, you know, to steal your brother's wife. Like kill him and take his wife. And Salome, of course, was his niece in a sense. Right? You know, and so he lusted after Salome and gave Salome anything she wanted. Now, did Salome, was Salome overly interested in John the Baptist's head? No, right? Why did she ask for John the Baptist's head? Because her mother told her, right? And being a good daughter, she listened to her mother and went and told Herod. Now, what was Herod's response when Salome asked for John the Baptist's head? You know, he was sad because he liked John the Baptist, but evidently he wasn't too sad. Right? Because what did he do when she asked? Made it, Made it happen, right? Called one of his servants, and the servant went downstairs and cut John the Baptist's head off, and you know, that was kind of the end of the story. So it's not John the Baptist that Jesus is talking about here. Like what he's saying is twofold. First of all, he's prophesying something about himself. Right? Because what are the Pharisees going to do in a couple of chapters? Right? They're going to crucify Jesus. But he also says that they were guilty of the blood of the prophets of the Old Testament. And this is important because it's something about the nature of the covenantal responsibilities that the reprobate had. You know, one of the questions that often gets thrown back at people who believe in election and predestination is that it's unfair. You know, because does anybody choose to be reprobate? No, not really, right? But does anybody choose to be saved either? No. Right? And Paul, of course, anticipates this line of argument because in Romans 9, what does he say? God will have mercy on whom he has mercy, compassion on who he has compassion. And the reality is the Pharisees, they have shown themselves to be reprobate because of their actions, because of their spirit, because of what they do. And it's not just the fact that they're getting ready to kill Jesus, but you know, they have already filled themselves up with the measure of their father's guilt. Right? Because their fathers, being the false prophets of the Old Testament, you know, killing the good prophets of the Old Testament, and what did they teach that made them false prophets? Who'd they tell the people to worship? You know, Baal and Ashtaroth, all the false gods of the nations around them. So that's strike one. And then, when opportunity was given unto them to repent, what did they do? They shouted down the true prophets and led the people astray. Yeah, I say this all the time. My favorite story in all Bible is Ahab and uh, Jehoshaphat sitting there at a council talking about what to do about the people in Assyria and Jehoshaphat, you know, godly Jehoshaphat says, hey, why don't we go ask a prophet? A prophet will tell us what to do. And you can hear Ahab through the Bible uh, as you're reading it audibly sigh. Right? Because what's Ahab's problem with the prophets? They always tell me something bad. Right? <laughs> You know, he's tired of the prophets because the prophets always come in there and say, quit sinning, right? And what does Ahab want to do? Keep on, Keep on sinning, right? So he searches out for prophets who, who do what? <laughs> Make them feel good, right? Tell them what he wants to hear, right? And of course, we're all good Ahabs every now and then, right? You know, we, we sometimes we seek out things we want to hear. Right? Not what we need to hear, but what we want to hear. And... Of course, the prophet comes and tells Ahab and Jehoshaphat, don't do this. And Ahab throws his hands there and says, of course he was going to say that, right? Because he always prophesies bad stuff to me. Well, the Pharisees are like these false prophets who came up to Ahab and told them what they wanted to hear. And telling people what they want to hear is good business, right? You know, not that I'm complaining or anything, but... You know, I, I don't have a jet. Right? <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't live in a $7 million mansion outside of Houston, right? Um, but what do the false prophets, how do they live in our day and age? 
with the world, right? And so they are blessed with the things of the world. Remember something Jesus said in Matthew 6 about the Pharisees. They have their reward, right? Yeah. That's what the Joel Alsteins and the, uh, what's that lady's name in St. Louis? I can never remember her name. Uh, oh, goodness. Uh, not Myers. Yeah, Joyce Myers. That's her name. Uh, you know, she has a compound outside St. Louis that has like six mansions on it. You know, and then Creflo Dollar down in Atlanta. Remember, he, he sent out a prayer request uh, asking his congregation to pray that uh, that he could get a new jet because evidently the one he had wasn't good enough. And what did his congregation do? They gave him a new jet, right? Because what do people want to hear? <laughs> they want to hear that they're good, that everything they want is what God wants, and that's exactly what the Pharisees have been doing, and they have been getting paid well for it. And they are living well. And like I said, Jesus says they have their reward. Right? They've sought the things of the world and they've been rewarded with the things of the world. And the Pharisees here in Matthew 23, right, you know, they have filled up then the measure of Father's guilt. Right? Serpents were to vipers. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore indeed I said you prophets, wise men and scribes, some of whom, some of them you will kill and crucify, some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. And of course, that's what happens to the apostles, right? You know, you know who's the first martyr uh, in the book of Acts? Stephen, Stephen right? You know, so what, what do they do to Stephen? Stone him to death, right? And then who's the who's the next one who's named at least? James, right? You know, James is next, and a and a different Herod. Right? Remember, he arrests him and cuts his head off. And then what happens to that hair? That's right, he gets eaten by worms. That, the judgment of the Lord came upon him. And James the just, the brother of Jesus, uh, you know, he's the one who is, is killed for these reasons. And so Jesus here prophesies and they fulfill that prophecy. That on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth and the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. And surely I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Now again, you know, Jesus is applying on them all the sin that has taken place from Adam until now. Because not only are they of their, son, uh, of their father the devil, right? Who, who killed Abel? Cain killed Abel. And so they are of the line of Cain. So this is a statement that they are outside the covenant blessings of the Lord. Because remember, Cain had a mark on him. And in the book of Revelation, it talks about people with a mark, right? Two kinds of people with marks, right? You know, what kind of mark do we not want? Mark of the, devil, mark of the beast, right? The mark of the devil. Well, this is what the Pharisees have. They have the mark of the devil on them. And the difference between the mark, uh, the, the covenant mark, the good mark that believers have, and the, and the mark of the beast is, remember, how do people get the mark of the beast in the book of Revelation? They sign up for it, right? They go to wherever it's being given out and they ask for it. Now, you know, just kind of backtrack a little bit. Uh, the mark of the beast is not a literal physical thing, right? So you don't have to worry about, you know, the, you know, the government placing a chip in you or something like that being the mark of the beast. You know, it's not a physical thing. It's not a tattoo. It's not anything like that, right? It is a spiritual mark. And just like the mark of Christ upon you is a spiritual uh, a thing, right? It's a thing that, that the Holy Spirit recognizes, that the angels recognize as they're flying around doing angel stuff, right? They see these marks on people. And they know, you know, who belongs to the Lord and who is an enemy of the Lord. Now... So we, we hear this testimony about the Pharisees, right? The Pharisees are easy to pick on because they're Pharisees, right? But what about the rest of the reprobate? What about, you know, those who aren't Pharisees, uh, those who uh, you know, aren't killing prophets, who just happen to be bad people, right? Because one of the things the Bible teaches us is how many people are bad? All of us, right? There is none who does good. Bible says. Well, 
when we think about that, right, we, we think about the reprobate, and we think about the difference between the reprobate and the elect. Right? The difference between the elect and the reprobate is that when the work of God happens upon them, how do they respond? How do the elect respond when they hear the voice of their master? They listen. They follow him. They run to him. When the reprobate hear the voice of Christ, what do they do? Run away. They scream. They plug their ears. You know, they do everything they can to not he heed him. Now, there might, you know, we also see like in the parable of the sower that there are reprobate who do for a time confess Jesus. But, you know, what do we see, for instance, with the seed that falls in the thorny ground? Right? It grows up and gets choked, right, by the cares of the world. Right? Then there's the, the stuff that throws in the rocks. What happens to it? Right? It gets baked by the sun. The, 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 the difference between a reprobate and, and, and an elect person it has nothing to do with them. What it has to do is where the Holy Spirit guides that seed to fall. Right? The seed that falls in the elect, right, it goes in the good ground. It's already been tilled and plenty of nitrogen in it and all that good stuff. And what does it do? It grows. Right? We hear in Psalm 1 that... That seed is nurtured by Jesus Christ, right? It's planted by the river flowing, and it grows, and it's strengthened by the river which never ceases. But the reprobate, right, when they, uh, you know, are convicted and when they understand the nature of things, as we hear in verse 28 of Romans chapter 1, it says, Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a base mind to do those things that were not fitting. Right. One of the one of the things about the judgments of the Lord upon the reprobate is that they knowingly and consciously run away from the Lord. Right. They are interested in destroying whatever lines of communication exist between the Lord and uh, themselves. And so, it, as it says there, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, right, earlier on Paul used the language of suppress. You know, uh, you know, Paul isn't a psychologist, but you know, what do psychologists say about suppression? It's a, it's a way of not dealing with something, right? So you kind of try to file it away in the subconscious and not think about it anymore. And and what what does psychologists like to say about people who do that kind of thing? Right? It's it's bad, right? It's harmful, you know. And, and so what do psychologists try to do? I bring it out. Right? And deal with it so that you can move on from it. Well, the reprobate, right, they suppress it with the intention of hiding it so that it's never seen. In the Old Testament, we get this picture of, of, of reprobate men trying to hide in the bowels of the earth. Right? They run into a mountain and try to hide. And, and what does the mountain do? It, it crushes them, right? It falls on them. You know, in, in the scripture passage this morning, number 28, uh, it talks about, right, the sky turns into bronze and the ground turns into iron. All right? And what happens if you're in between bronze and iron? <laughs> you get crushed, right? Uh, you know, mortar and pestle type stuff. Right? You, you know, if you, you're trying to make, you know, good, um, you, know, you know, spices or whether you're trying to make, you know, stuff for art and stuff, right? Use mortar and pestle and you, Grind it up, right? And you turn it into a powder. Well, that's what the Lord promises will happen to those who attempt to do this, right? Because there is no hiding from the Lord. And so what does God do to those who would do, do not like to retain God in their knowledge? Right? God gives them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Right? This is just like the Pharisees, just like the false prophets. They receive their reward. Now, the problem with their reward is what does it do for them? It leads to destruction. Right? It leads to damnation. It leads to hell itself. You know, the old saying is that there's not a person in hell who does not want to be there. 
There's nobody in hell who either doesn't deserve to be there or doesn't want to be there. Right? Because the idea of spending a moment with God is what under there? It's terror under there, right? And we also understand something else about the nature of hell in regards to this. You know, some people uh, have said in the past, you know, meaning well, that hell is the absence of God. But it's actually the opposite. Like what What is hell? It's the very presence of God without his mercy, without his grace. The pureness of his wrath for all of eternity. Right? And we see a picture of this, of course, with uh, the, uh, you know, the, the rich man and Lazarus. Right? The rich man goes to hell and what does he ask for? Lazarus dip his finger and put it on his tongue. Now, what would your first question be to somebody if you were in hell and look it up? Get me out of here, right? But his only concern is for what? He's thirsty because he's hot and he's in hell. So he has no desire to be saved. His only desire is to have the judgment, the consequences of judgment removed from him. Now, as they're having this conversation, right, you know, you know, he says, well, go tell my brothers about, about this. And, and what does Abraham say to him? Right? They have Moses and the prophets. And then he says, well, they don't believe Moses and the prophets. So, um, you know, maybe let me out and I'll go tell them. And, and, and what, what, is he, what does Abraham say? They would not believe even if a man rose from the dead. Well, guess what? What happened? A man rose from the dead. And did all these people all of a sudden start believing in Jesus because a man rose from the dead? No, right? Because that's not how the reprobate mind works. Right? You'll never argue somebody into the kingdom of heaven. Right? The, 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 you know, the way right, we gain you know, an, a hearing for the Lord right, is through faithfully presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? Faithfully presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ and teaching of the things of Christ will lead to, right, in God's mercy and His providence, conversions. And we ask those things, we seek those things, because we know who's responsible for conversion. The Holy Spirit is, right? The Holy Spirit convicts the heart. The Holy Spirit shows forth, you know, fruits meant for repentance. Now, you know, one last thing, and we'll, we'll close on this, is... You know, when we think about hell, when we think about the nature of hell, right, you know, we've already kind of touched on this, but you know, what, what, what do you think of when you think of hell? Fire? Right? And, and why do we think of fire when we think of hell? Hmm? Right, the lake of fire, right? You know, the book of Revelation tells us that Satan and his minions and the, his... Um, those who are in league with him are cast into the lake of fire. Right. Now, you, what's another thing we think of when we think of hell? Gnashing of teeth, Gnashing of teeth and wailing. Right. Now, imagine that for a second. You know, why are people gnashing their teeth? The pain. Yeah, that part of it's the pain, but you know, you think of the image there, gnashing of teeth. You know, why do we gnash our teeth? Anger. Anger. Right? So what are people in hell doing? Right? They're angry at God. Right? They are blaspheming the Lord. They are yelling to and about the Lord. And again, there is no sense of propriety. Or decorum, whatever word you want to use, because right, you know, they hate God, and they are continuing their attitude that they had here on the earth. You know, they they nothing has changed in their behavior, in their mindset. Even death itself has not chastened them. Even the reality of what they see has not changed them. And we even see, for instance. You know, in, in, in Matthew 25, when there is the day of judgment and there's separation, 
you. The way I understand that passage is that there's literally going to be a day of judgment and Jesus is literally going to be sitting on a throne and you're literally going to be called to account by the Lord Jesus. Now, if you're witnessing this and you are elect, what is your response going to be? Exactly what we see in Matthew 25, right? When did I do these things? Right? The Lord said, as you did unto others, you did them unto me, right? Well, again, that's a testimony of the fruits born of the Holy Spirit, of the way that you worked good works, right? Not to earn a place in heaven, but out of a, uh, again, out of the movement of the heart uh, that had been changed by the Holy Spirit. Whereas the, those who are goats, those who go on the left, you know, they hear the opposite thing. And they, and again, the way I understand it, they're going to be witnessing all this stuff happen. Do we get any sense in, in the Bible that they are trying to defend themselves? No, right? In fact, in the day of judgment, they will be uh, justifying themselves instead of defending themselves, which is a whole different kind of, you know, thing, Right? They're going to say, well, I don't really care what you say. I was a good person. Right? I don't really care what you say. I did what I thought was right. Well, you know, in the immortal words of John Calvin, good luck with that. Right? That's not how that works. Right? You see, the spirit of the elect is humility. Right? The spirit of the elect is you know, good works done without without thinking about it really, right? It's a it's an attitude, it's a it, it's it's a witness in the midst of these things. And so, you know, the you know, you know I know preachers are real good at saying the last thing and then saying the last thing again, but I mean it this time. Right? The 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 last thing, you know, that we think about when it comes to hell is that, you know, just as heaven is a little bit different now than it will be in the future, right? Because right now where where is heaven? Where God is, right? You know, it's up there somewhere, right? We, we don't know exactly where it is, right? You can't find it with the Hubble telescope or anything, right? It, it's, it's up there somewhere. But where's heaven going to be in the future? Here, right? It's going to be on earth. It's going to be in the creation that God has made and declared holy, right? That's part of the work of redemption that Jesus is going to fulfill and do. Now, where is hell right now? Yeah, it's it's somewhere, right? Now, hell is not going to change locations when Christ comes again. Right? Because remember, you know, who, who has been preparing a place uh, for the devil from before the foundation of the world? Yeah, God has, right? Now, you know, God, you know, hell's not going to be like in the core of the earth or something, right? Um, you know, that's kind of how the medievals understood it, right? Heaven's up here and hell's down there, right? You know, hell is somewhere far away from where the people of God are, right? Because not only is there no opportunity for us to see people in hell, but it's as far as the east is from the west, right? That's the way the, the Bible understands that. And, you know, the, the reality is, again, is that there is no partiality with God. You know, he is not going to look upon us and give, well, not upon us, but upon the reprobate and give the reprobate a second chance, right? Again, just like he said to Pharisees, the reprobate have their reward, right? They've received the wages of sin and they will, you know, be paying off in a sense those sins forever and ever and adding on to those sins forever and ever. And so we'll go ahead and close on that. But any questions or, or comments about all that? All right. Let's go ahead and close the word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again uh, for a time you give to us to uh, talk about uh, subjects, especially subjects like this that aren't the most pleasant. Dear God, we know uh, that uh, they are a part of your word and we are strengthened uh, by the knowledge of what reality is. For dear God, you've called us to uh, not just love your word, but to spread your word. God, for we would love that all uh, would come to repentance. God, we pray for the work that you've called us to do in that regard. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, our uh, benediction tonight comes to us from Hebrews 13. And so we'll go ahead and uh, go there and close 
tonight. Verses 20 and 21. Hear the word of the Lord. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.